we all assume that wheels were always here. There were no wheels in North America until the Spaniards landed in Mexico in 1513. No wheels. Everybody trudged around to think to be big cart heads. No carts, no wheels. In Mexico, there was a child's toy with a little tiny wheel on it, but they never ramped it up to a wagon or a coach or a railroad. So that was very important. There were also no horses. They went extinct on this continent about 10,000 years ago. So they introduced the horse. So people were getting around pretty much by foot. Uh, Great Britain really invented the railroad and, <clears throat> and the locomotive. And it was not until 1830 that Baltimore, Baltimore and Ohio Railroad was very worried about their future. The Erie Canal had just been completed. 375 mile hand dug across upstate New York, 60 foot mine, mine stone uh, bridgements to get through, and uh, they were stealing all the business. They were getting to the Midwest and the Great Lakes and down the Mississippi. So the Baltimore and Ohio said, let's build a railroad. So they started it. The first engine or two were built in, uh, in Europe, in Great Britain, but Great Britain's pretty flat. And they made big, heavy trains, and so we had trouble with the design. And they didn't have many turns, so they weren't good at making turns. So then we started our own locomotives. Now, how did people travel? Well, we didn't have the wheel and we didn't have the horse. Going back, actually, 20,000 years, people were on foot, canoe, some type of boat, but not canoe. Uh, then, once the uh, Spaniards arrived, horses, wagons, coaches, stage coaches to get around. Um, then the steam engine was invented. Then you had the steam boat, steam locomotive. And finally, in 1869, a trip that used to take six months to get from New York to San Francisco now took eight days. So some unbelievable advances. And then, of course, they surprised the car comes in. And uh, an airplane and subway. Now, the westward settlement in the country uh, was kind of in waves, and we numbered them. So you had the 13 original colonies. This, by the way, is mapped in 1754. Then people came down from further north. The Appalachians go from Tennessee to Maine, and they're not just one mountain. It's multiple mountain ranges. You know, the Blue Ridge is the Smokies, but they're all part of the Appalachians. And in between mountains, there was a big valley. It's called the Great Valley. It has names in different states, different names. But you'll know it as the Shenandoah. So that's number two. And then finally, Daniel Boone broke through in a gap in the Appalachian Mountains on the west side and cut a road called the Wilderness Trail. And over the next several years, 200,000 people funneled through to Kentucky, <coughs> Kentucky and Tennessee. So the whole area in the middle started filling in. And then uh, Thomas Jefferson negotiated the Louisiana Purchase and bought all of Grant's his land. So all the purple became ours. And had Lewis and Clark go explore this unknown area to Oregon that nobody had claimed. There were some Russian claims up here and some Canadian. So, but then in 1848, Texas became a republic, and the whole Southwest, it's called the Mexican Session, uh, all the southern, southwestern states became part of the U.S. So that was allowed opening here, so the Santa Fe Trail started going down to Santa Fe, and the city of Albuquerque was built. Now that wilderness trail is the red dot. So here's the Cumberland Valley, and that let them get through to Kentucky and Tennessee and so on and start to move west. Then the wagon trains, another wave, came in the 1840s. And so you had first the Oregon Trail, then you had the Mormon Trail. After the leader of Mormons was killed in the Midwest, they went to part so with Utah to Salt Lake City and settled there. Then California Trail, and then finally when the southwestern states became, or southwestern 
section of the country became part of the United States. The Santa Fe Trail opened up there. So what was America like before the railroads? Pretty confined. I mean, I'll jump to the bottom. People were totally self-sufficient. They were, by today's parlance, off the grid. There was no grid. <laughs> and there are people today who yearn for that. Uh, but they made their own clothes and they only ate what they could grow or catch. Uh, they couldn't travel very well. Uh, everything was done by hand. They heated their home with uh, whatever was available. And in the Great Plains, it was mostly cattle, uh, which I'm sure was fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, so before you can start a railroad, it's not like these technologies pop out of the ground and fully form. For this whole thing to work, other things have to happen first. And this is true for every new break. So rails themselves, we originally tried in mines and places like that wood. But when you put a heavy train on the wood, it's washable. So then they trim the wood uh, with iron. That wasn't strong enough. Then they went to Broadway. Uh, ultimately, in 1856, Bessemer in England came up with a process to create steel out of iron, and it made it very, uh, very inexpensive compared to iron and much stronger. So that became the standard. Uh, the telegraph came along in 1816, but you can't do anything with the telegraph without power. Oh, we're just the battery had just been invented. So you had power through the telegraph all over the country. Uh, and then, of course, the Morse code made life simpler in 1836. The big one was tunneling. We are a very mountainous country, even though we're not here. <laughs> High points 10 feet. Uh, but, but for instance, to go through the Sierra Madre, they had to dig 15 tunnels. Those are the mountains closest to California, to the west coast. Uh, 15 tunnels, a total of 6,200 feet tunneling with dynamite, nitroglycerin. It, it was pretty dangerous work. And then the other thing you need for such a massive enterprise is some engineering talent. And we can particularly have that. But fortunately, the Erie Canal had just been out of New York, and they were able to train other people and take that engineering skill forward during the 1800s. So Lincoln had a vision for this country. Step back to the funny story. When he was a young man in 1819 in Illinois, uh, he took flatboats. Everybody brought their goods to New Orleans on flatboats, not much more than a raft. And of course, that was a one way trip because Mississippi flows south. So you get to New Orleans, you sell your goods, then you sell the wood of the flatboat, and you hike 800 miles up to Natchez Trace and go home. Until next year, we can do it again. So Lincoln had a sense for the country. So in 1862, right at the time of the Civil War, he approved the Transcontinental Railroad. Now, he was trying to hold the North and South together, but few people realized he was trying to hold the East and West together. I mean, you had six months to get from one end to the other. It wasn't a tight deal. And, uh, you know, with Slavery starting to spread to the West, a dirty, contentious issue. Endless battles in Congress beginning in 1830. And of course, it wasn't until the 1860s that we had the war. Now, I mentioned this is a mountainous country. And of course, from where we're sitting, that's not so true. But you have the Appalachians here. And you do notice the valley down the middle. Can you see that from out there? Bob? Yeah. yeah. And you have the Rockies and the Sierra Madre. So if you're coming from Sacramento, you're coming through uh, some pretty high mountains. So the Transcontinental Railroad, the Western Expansion really started with Daniel Boone back at the Wilderness Trail. By this time, by 1862, you had all these railroad lines to the east, and guess where Omaha is? It's at the front. And then the Transcontinental goes across here to Sacramento, and then ultimately to San Francisco. 
And this was hard work. It was a lot of digging. It wasn't heavy equipment. So what Lincoln chartered was two railroads, one to start in Omaha, one to start in Sacramento, and race to the middle, which was the monetary Utah. And this is the celebration after completing, coincidentally, 1,776 miles. So what do you think was the most dangerous job in the tunneling? Possibly lighting the fuse? Yeah. Most people think that, but really the most dangerous job was the guy who had to go back and relight it if it didn't go. <laughs> so how did railroads transform America? You know, it's funny looking at different articles, usually people mention three or four things. You know, it's kind of brushed off. It truly transformed this nation. And I mean, we're going to go through these, maybe not all, but a lot of them. But number one, unifying the country, facilitated colonization or settlement with hundreds of millions of acres given and 1.6 million homesteaders. Um, unfortunately, displacing the Native Americans from their lands, and that was a long and arduous battle for both sides, really drove economic growth, increased the availability of goods and materials. People, when they're on the prairie, they built their houses out of whatever was there, mud. Now they could get on. You know, so everything fed on itself. Some uh, other, of course, communications improved dramatically. Funny one, forced standardization. The South, the difference, the width between the railroad time, uh, rails was five feet. In the North, it was four feet, eight and a half inches. So when they came together, would you all help me move the stuff off this train onto that train? <laughs> For example, everybody went by solar time. It's tough to publish a train schedule if it's 9.20 in Buffalo and it's 9 o'clock in New York. So they had a standardized time. Um, supported, enabled urbanization, industrialization, resulted in unionization. I got stuck on unionization. <laughs> they kept rolling. Uh, but we'll go back into these. An interesting one is improved diet. You ate what you grew or could catch or shoot, and now you can get different types of foods. You wouldn't have to do long cattle drives to get the cattle as close as possible to where it's butchered so it's fresh. You can now ship it. And we'll come back to some of these. So unification we talked about. Facilitated settlement, and let's look east on the left and West on the right. Um, by 1860, with railroads linking every major city in the north, the north had 70% north had of the railroad, almost all of the manufacturing capacity. In the south, primarily a cotton economy, and in general, they just wanted to get it to water. So they built rail lines to rivers that were navigable into the oceans and the Gulf. <coughs> And I mentioned the spacing. Going west, they created railroad towns, which became, in some cases, major cities like Albuquerque, and Cheyenne, Wyoming, and, uh, places like that. Um, and they, of course, started out not unlike the first settlers here in tents. The first settlers here in Jack's Peak were in tents. Well, these all started in tents, and then maybe they built wood homes, maybe ultimately wooden homes. Uh, the preemption acts in the 1830s and 50s allowed people to go west, squat on land, and preempt ownership. So when this, they had to, uh, they had to live there for five years, and they had to pay a dollar twenty-five an acre when the government ultimately offered the land. So that was a pretty good deal for them. But we did have some land rushes. The last one being 1869 in Oklahoma. What was the starting gun? This was land that had been originally reserved for the Native Americans, and they decided to do a lot of the way. In this country, there were a lot of different things that were very common in discussion. Manifest destiny, which said, you know, we really are going to cover the whole country. You had homestead principles. 
when the people in the Northeast wanted everybody to be able to go west and have farms and have their own land. So it's called the Homestead Principle Act. And they really lasted from 1850 to 1930. So it was a long-held belief in the country that people should be able to homestead. Uh, as I said, unfortunate byproduct, of course, is displacement of the Native Americans. And if you look on the right, this is a picture of uh, a lot of Seminoles and Jacksonville Beach residents in 1900. But during the 1800s, we thought, fought three major wars with the Seminoles. And I don't mean, you know, let's get our rifles together. Army, Navy, and Marines battled. This was an entire U.S. federal government launch against the Seminoles. And then the Indian Removal Act of 1830 basically took Indians out of the southeast, including uh, South Carolina, uh, to Arkansas and Oklahoma. And a great many of the people died along the way. This is a big one, drove economic growth. Everybody had national, international markets. You could get things from anywhere. If you were a manufacturer, you could get the raw materials much more easily. So the whole idea of the supply chain uh, helped. Um, the railroads were willing to build branch lines. You know, if your business wasn't right at the railroad. So like we had two branch lines here, the J and A from here. To find either, actually it was a trestle uh, to when it was Mineral City to get titanium out for flares in World War I. So that was one branch line. The other was in Cracker Town. We had a branch line for the lumber operation down uh, along the intercoastal. Uh, okay. So here's an example of getting raw materials to market. Uh, most people made their own clothes in the country. Um, Southern cotton uh, was king, but in uh, 1793, Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin to get the seeds out, and all of a sudden worker productivity went up by a factor of 50. So Charleston became uh, as sophisticated a city as France and Paris. Uh, Natchez, Mississippi had more millionaires per capita than any place in the world. So cotton was king. The northern mills started out, there was water power, all the rivers. Uh, coming down, you know, the Connecticut River, the, um, uh, what's the one in Pittsfield, and the Fall River. Uh, each river coming out had a fair amount of power, and they started water mills, and then ultimately they used the water for steam. So you had a lot of manufacturing there, turning the cotton into clothing. So by 1850, men's clothing was the biggest business in New York City, the largest employer, because everybody made them home before. It was a dramatic. Lowell, I'm Lowell, Mass. You've probably heard of Lowell, Massachusetts, which is a monstrous mill facility with still air that's being converted. It's having another life, but there was a tremendous amount of cotton and mills there. Communications. This, is, to me, is fascinating. You know, put in red the two main points. For 16,000 years till uh, 1830 ish, uh, communications linked to transportation. If you wanted to get a message from here to there, you carried it. Smoke signals, a messenger, stagecoach. Uh, there was stagecoach lines that had uh, contracts with the government. There was one from uh, St. Louis to San Francisco. They got 300,000 a year from the government, the stagecoaches to deliver mail. Uh, so it was always transportation. So that's all transportation. Then in 1816, the telegraph was invented, and all of a sudden, things could be done in seconds. It was just so dramatic, it was unbelievable. And then the Transcontinental Railroad, built in 1869, and railroads in general beginning in 1830, things were much faster. So as I said before, it used to take six months to get from New York to San Francisco. Now it took seven to eight days. But what they did for their own use was the railroads built telegraph lines next to the bed so they could communicate and make sure that everybody was getting paid, getting supplies in the right place. 
And then, of course, the, the telegraph companies made a major business out of it, ultimately ending up with total monopoly by Western Union over the years. Now, this is the blue, and this is North America, the mail routes. So this is from the US Post Office. This was their mail routes to get mail around. And in the middle, I put, once we had the railroads, there were whole rows of cars where they were stacking mail, not unlike today's post office. <coughs> so to give you an idea, I've mentioned the six months. Uh, if you wanted to go one route, you came around Cape Horn up to San Francisco. Uh, the other is from, let's say, New York through the Gulf to Panama. Walker, 65 miles across Panama, or they, later they built the railroad across Panama, before the Panama Canal, and then take the ship up to San Francisco, or go by stagecoach or horse or covered wagon across the country. So that's what people were facing. I mentioned earlier the drive for standard, standardization. The first thing on the left is the most significant. Uh, Eli Whitney didn't make much money on the cotton gin. He didn't patent it. So a few years later, uh, he got a contract with the federal government to build 10,000 rifles. And he decided to take a new approach to the manufacturing and have standardized parts, interchangeable parts, brand new. Now before that, every rifle maker made every rifle a little different. And it was different in California than New York. And there were no standards. So he standardized it. And that became one of the most amazing things of the 19th century because that got adopted. And of course, the ultimate thing, you know, Henry Ford built the manufacturing plant and took it to another level with standardization. Uh, Wire magazine recently said that the American machine tool industry was uh, the equivalent of what computer and networking and the internet were to the 20th century. And then on the right, I mentioned time varying. So can you imagine trying to run a railroad when everybody's clocked <coughs> uh, 10 miles away it might be different. So in 1883, the railroads all agreed. It was kind of like Y2K. <laughs> Certain date, 1883, everybody changed their time to standard time. And then that was followed further with the Standard Time Act in 1918. We talked about the track usage in 1863, during the Civil War, legislation was passed to standardize the tracks so there'd be more interchangeability. The Morse code itself was a standard, it became a worldwide standard. Now, this whole idea of standards in every industry has now resulted in 800,000 global standards today. <laughs> Don't ask me to name them. Um, encouraged agriculturization is actually a word. I, I dreamed it up and then I looked it up and it exists. Uh, but there were millions of acres. We already talked about the squatters at about 25 an acre. Later, the Illinois Central trying to offer south of the Great Lakes uh, $12 an acre. So you can see the squatters got a heck of a good deal. But by the 1860s, 80% of farms were, not 1860s, 1880s, uh, were within five miles of a railroad. Enabled urbanization. This picture on the top right, that's Park Avenue in New York. Before they put the railroads into Grand Central Station. So Park, Park Avenue was a railroad bed. A little different today. Ten, twenty million dollar condos. So the way it enabled the railroads and enabled the urbanization. So the steel railroad tires became the standard. That provided Carnegie with a very good market for steel to supply the railroads. And then they started building bridges, and the first one was across the Mississippi and one across the Missouri with steel. And then architects kind of got this idea. They said, well, all the buildings we build today, every wall is weight-bearing, so we can't go more than six, seven, eight stories. That's the highest building because every inch of every wall had a bare weight, so they were this deep, not a two by three deep. And so they said, why don't we make these buildings out of steel, have a 
steel skeleton and then hang decorative walls around the steel skeleton. All of a sudden, the cities went up. And the cities actually were built within the cities, uh, primarily by horses and immigrants in steel and the materials brought by the railroads. Now the horses, funny story, the biggest problem was what would you expect? If the streets are crowded with horses, manure. And who picks it up? Major problem for 100 years. Um, and in fact, the second problem was the treatment of horses. And that's how the ASPCA got started. It was totally there to protect horses. Now, it can be a little messy when you're doing a transition of technology from horses to, uh, to electric trolleys to uh, a logging truck, all on the same street in the city. So you have the electric trolleys here, horses, a truck carrying uh, trees, uh, all intersecting. Now, you've all had this experience going from uh, VCR to TV. <laughs> it also, the railroad supported industrialization. You talk very gently the whole idea of supply chain getting a supply chain getting everything in the right place at the right time. And of course, the railroads themselves provided a big market. But here's an advertisement uh, for the Midwest again, you know, and it says, looking for a plant location. Everybody's advertising free land or a plant location next to a railroad. The other thing that got proven during the Civil War was how important the railroad and the telegraph could be uh, during the war and the future war. And um, I will endeavor <laughs> to explain it because there are literally books written on the logistics treat, uh, uh, true, true movement of supplies of trying to block trains and trying to uh, do everything they could possibly do to beat one another. Um, and it's, uh, it's a sad story, but it, it did prove the utilization of trains. Uh, one of my favorite stories was that Abraham Lincoln was the commander in chief, but today that's kind of a nominal title. When he was president, he personally sent over a thousand telegrams during the war field commit commanders directing them in the back. So the telegraph along the railroad line was really harnessed. There had to be an increased focus on safety for workers. Uh, if you look at this wooden, it's not too symmetrical, uh, trestle uh, built in the rush, because they were measuring how many miles a day the teams could uh, lay track. Uh, do you think that was built uh, with scaffolding and the uh, OSHA standards? <laughs> Probably not. They had to rebuild it. And here's the result here of the track, the, the locomotive at the bottom of the uh, cavern. Improved diet. So all of a sudden you didn't have to just eat what was right there. You could get fruits and vegetables. Uh, meat could be taken to different places. And then, of course, with refrigeration, that uh, that made you be able to do a lot more. Resulted in the unionization. It wasn't a big thing, but in 1861, the first national uh, union was formed. You know, you have wages, you have safety, you have all those kind of issues. But the focus of the union movement in the latter part of the 19th century was primarily on the skilled workers, including the telegraph operators. And it wasn't really until the 1930s that the movement moved further uh, with unskilled laborers. And the last two transformative effects are innovation. All of a sudden, people are doing national and international advertising, whether it's for good or for land. Farmland for $12 an acre. Uh, they were always pushing the limits in terms of the strength of the steel, of the power, looking for other choices other than steam, because you're constantly shoving wood or coal in to keep the steam going. And we ended up with the electric light bulb and the internal combustion engine by uh, Carl Benz and then the diesel engine. And then the next step is utilizing the railroad uh, within cities in some ways in trolleys. In fact, my great grand 
grandfather in the early 1920s uh, was the horse-drawn trolley driver on 2nd Avenue in New York. And my father could look out the window from my grandfather's home and see when my grandfather was coming home at night because he could see the sparks of the hooves of the horses hitting the rats. <laughs> so they were in the cities. And in advance, new skills, the engineering, design, bridge building. And a, a subtle one is the management of large organizations. Before railroads, you know, there were just little clusters of families and people working together. There wasn't big organizations. The only big organization was the military, and that's run in a different way. People do exactly what you tell them. Uh, and so the railroad gave management experience for large organizations. And ex explosives utilization, how to use explosive safety. Now, did you ever wonder about the name of the Brooklyn Dodgers? <laughs> they were Dodger in the trolleys. It was named that in 1895 and later shortened. Now, this tremendous progress resulted in a concentration of power. Not unlike today, where Amazon and Google are taking over the world. You get a whole new wave, and here you had uh, these very strong railroads that control the workers, uh, and there was a focus there. But bigger than that was the consolidation of the railroads. So you went from hundreds, maybe thousands of railroads down to 20 in a fairly short period of time. So the government got nervous and uh, wrote the Interstate Commerce Act, which created the ICC. For and travel between the states, and then the Sherman Anthony Trust Act, because Teddy Roosevelt became the trust buster trying to break up these monopolies and get better prices. And meanwhile, on the farmland, they were creating grains trying to fight the railroads and prices. So, that was our focus on how the railroads transformed America. Pretty significant and I think much more comprehensive than uh, I ever realized. Now the beaches. By the way, this is all the different panels on the beaches from the top to bottom from Mayport Town to Atlanta. Uh, and at Mayport, it was an orange plantation. We'll take a quick look at the backdrop for the beaches. St. Augustine was the center of the universe. That was the capital. Uh, Jacksonville didn't exist, and they were in exist. Um, Fort Caroline and St. Augustine uh, were built on top of the old uh, Native American villages. They had picked the best spots, so the Spaniards and the French and then the Spaniards uh, took those spots away. In 1702, from Michael Road north to Mayport was all part of the 60,000 acre cattle ranch owned by Don Diego Espinosa. By 1800, there were three major plantation owners on the islands. By the way, none of this is cotton. Um, you had the Sanchez, and he had seven different cattle plantations. He also owned all of San Jose. Uh, you had the Queen, who had the San Pablo plantation that went from about the golf course in Jack's Beach up to Dutton Island Road. Now you notice everybody's focused on the river. Nobody cared about the ocean. The ocean was useless. You couldn't grow anything there, and you couldn't build docks and bring boats back and forth. So at this time, the ocean was useless. And the Queen also owned Ortega, 6,000 acres at Ortega. Uh, Deweese uh, had an orange plantation at Mayport, Van Brand. So that's a snapshot of 1800. Then we went through just a crazy period. And if you can't read this, it's basically we were Spanish for hundreds of years, then English for 20, then Spanish again, then the U.S. territory, then the U.S. state, then a seceded state, then a reinstated state, and then a state under federal, federal occupation for as much as 15 years. So it was quite a crazy time. And the population, you know, when the Declaration of Independence occurred, you know where the loyalists went? To Florida. The English Florida at the time. The 
population in Florida tripled with all the loyalists coming here. And even what? <laughs> now I mentioned that St. Augustine was the center of the universe. This is a, a schematic, so I didn't bother using a real uh, map, thanks to my sister Peggy, so nobody's going to understand that. So this is the beach, the 30, 37 long mile, or 37 mile long island from Atlanta to Bayport. So there were four roads. Number one was 20 mile road. This was the old Indian trail that connected the Indian village at St. Augustine with the Indian village at Port Carolina. And then when the Spanish came, Ferrer um, marched up with the guidance of the local Native Americans, I'm sure, and cut the old path back with 400 and some troops to attack Port Carolina. That's a 40 mile stretch that became called 20 mile road because the halfway station to watering horses and laden with the Spanish Inn and Spanish communication troops and the Osterreiter family, <laughs> uh, all on 20 mile road. Uh, so that was the very first road. Then there was the Camino Real, which was a path, island topping, connecting all the missions along the coast up to South Carolina. Uh, the third one, was originally out to St. Mark's in Tallahassee from St. Augustine on the west. Now picture the whole southern tier of the country is Spanish, so it ultimately went to California. That's Interstate 10 today. Okay. All of a sudden, once we're through with the federal occupation and all the crazy political turnover, we had three railroads rushed to the beach. Now remember, the beach hadn't been valued that highly, but as the economy grew and there were more people uh, who had time, more middle class, and more wealthy people, uh, they're looking for places to go. So the railroads, the three of them, were here in Jacksonville, Mayport, and Pablo went out to uh, Mayport and to Burnside Beach. And that JMP, the local story is that you know, often when you're on the train with all the sand and sand dunes, uh, you had to get out and push the train. So they called the train the jump man and push. <laughs> the Jacksonville and Dam Railroad, which later became the Florida East Coast, and they built the hotel at the end of that. That's Beach Boulevard. Beach Boulevard was the railroad bed. Beach, the bridge and Beach Boulevard only opened in 1950. And then the St. Augustine and the North Beach Railway it connected from the library area in St. Augustine up to about you know, where the old gate station was if you're going down A1A. So it went across the water there. And what was on the other side were casinos, not gambling casinos, but you go over, it's a day trip from St. Augustine, you leave your hotel, you go over by boat, then there's a little tram pulled by a horse that takes you to the casino, and you put your bathing suit on and take off your, your bathing costume. You take off your clothes and have a locker. You go swimming, and you come back, you get a shower and dress, and dive and dance, and then take the tram back to the boat, and the boat back to St. Augustine. Well, they evolved that to build a railway instead of the horse-drawn tram, but it didn't last too long. Now, the other thing on the island that I mentioned earlier is there were two, uh, there were two ranch lines built, one to Pontevedra from the Middle City and one to Bracketown, and that just shows how Railroads were accommodating local industry around the country. So what happens at the end of the railroad line? Towns emerge from the railroad surge. So this is the Atlantic Beach train station where the Continental Hotel was uh, between 7th and 10th Street in Atlantic Beach. These are four folks sitting on the wagon there. This is where we are now, where the train is and the old Pablo station was here. Pablo being the name for Jacksonville Beach initially. Uh, the Mayport Village train coming in, and actually all the coal for the entire FEC line came in through Mayport on that thousand foot pier. There was a town called East Mayport that had its own station, and that would have been located right around the entrance to the, uh, the Navy base today. So that area was East Mayport. And then in Delano, this was the, tr the train station uh, for that St. Augustine and North Beach and Atlanta Beach. <coughs> uh, 
other hotels. The uh, Murray Hall was built. This would have been about where the bandstand is over along the beach. And the Continental Hotel, where the train station was, with a four-story rotunda. And that goes from 7th to 10th Street in Atlantic Beach. So I mentioned that Milano was very much a day tripper. So here's the tram. So you get off the boat on the Intracoastal and get on the tram and go over to the casino with the horse-drawn tram. Jack's Beach has had many lives, but it's always been the commercial center of the island. Very truly it has. Um, old photos of town. Of course, the uh, Coney Island period with Ferris wheels and roller coasters. Um, but it went through really significant growth in the 40s and 50s with World War II. So, and you end up with a lot of that staying here, a lot of industry coming. And the large employer in the Jack's Beach is the Beaches Hospital and now Baptist Beaches. Montevideo started out as Mineral City. Montevideo came in Plum, 1928, bought and forward. And it was originally a log cabin, so that's the 1934 photo. Uh, then we were able to attract the PGA Tour and the TPC, which is now the largest employer in Montevideo. And most of the population growth there was later. It was over 200% in the 70s and 80s. And you know, once Jimmy Stockton started Sawgrass, and then the Fletcher Bypass and Acres, and became 24 PUDs, planned unit developments. Atlantic Beach and Neptune Beach have a shared town center that's very popular and growing. Uh, Al just opened another restaurant and replaced Al's Pizza. Um, Atlantic Beach was incorporated in 1926. Neptune Beach, uh, Tax revolt and left Jacksonville Beach and became their own city in 1931. Uh, population growth in Atlantic Beach was very significant, 40s, 50s, 60s. Now we're in an infill kind of period. Uh, and Neptune Beach was primarily in the 40s after it became its own entity. Mayport again has had many lives. This is the uh, home of the owner of the Wonderwood Resort at the beach. This was a major resort with 20 buildings, a thousand foot dock out into the Revolt Bay, which later became the Navy carrier base. It went from three feet deep to 45 feet deep to accommodate the carrier. Uh, these are not carriers, but just to give you a sense for the Navy base, of course, uh, shrimping. And Mayport has a shared zip code with Atlantic Beach, so we couldn't get population breakouts. So this is a shared population breakout. But you can see the growth, 40s, 50s, and 60s, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. So a quick wrap up on how the railroads transformed the beaches. Uh, settlement, a local economic base, became self-sustaining. Uh, actually building the jetties, I don't know how many people know that, but we were rocks brought down from the north, mostly connected for 20 years by train. And then if they dropped the rocks in the ocean, they put track on top of the rocks, put more rocks in, put more track, and then went out three miles. Pretty amazing. So that was all railway track. Uh, provided a launch pad in each area for two businesses that became more international. Uh, the Mason Lumber Company that used to be located where Vistar is over here. Ray Mason, um, that became a Fortune 500 company called the Charter Company. And they were very successful for many years and then kind of faded out. And the McCormick family, originally building A1A from the St. John's County line down to St. Augustine in 1928, uh, they built a much bigger business, built a lot of a Navy base. And then ended up building a number of the bases in Vietnam. So they were an international business. Uh, railroads facilitated the development of a lot of Mayport industries over time, starting with uh, being a, well, they were, when they first started in 1830, they were providing naval supplies and lumber to the newly formed United States. So we were a supplier. That's how Mayport got started. 
Now, different story in St. John's County on the right. Uh, the railroads did enable the developments of some older businesses and facilitated the digging of the Florida East Coast Canal, now called the Intracoastal Waterway, which connected the San Pablo River on the north down just below the um, JTD Bridge. And if you look that way, it's a straight line for eight or nine miles down to the Palm Valley Bridge. That was all hand dug or dug with primitive equipment. Um, but once you got past the 20s, the railroad didn't have much impact here, and in fact, went bankrupt. That we seen in 1931. But the Jacksonville economic base really helped us, the whole island development. So having gotten that foothold early on was important. So as a reminder, we are an island, but we are connected. We have six bridges in turn. And also just remind you, we don't have a name. <laughs> what did I say, Chris? <laughs> Uh, but six bridges in the ferry do connect us with the rest of the world. But uh, I think the most important thing out of this, if you go back to uh, President Lincoln, wanting to unify the country. This is a shot from space of North America at night, which is lights. And it looks like his vision for unification worked pretty well. Now the part two of that is that when Lewis and Clark returned from their journey in 1806, and Lewis was Thomas Jefferson's personal secretary, reviewed their findings after years in the wilderness. Thomas Jefferson concluded that it would take a thousand generations to populate that land. But then along came the railroad. And it was done in three or four generations, not a thousand. So thank you for being here today. Any questions? Well, that's after my 
my sister had me take a lot of detail out. <laughs> Well, I think, I think Sarah may, is making a, a, a video, uh, yeah, maybe on the website. Yes. Any other questions? Yes. It was said earlier that there were four locations for this chapel. Where was the first location? It was, as I recall, on the beach. Uh, is Chris still here? Yeah. I, I believe it was on the beach. Then it was over near the church. It was right here on the Murray Hall Hotel that you mentioned. Yeah. And so we moved it from Jarbo Park to here. And it's staying here. <laughs> <laughs> and we're doing a ton of weddings. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing that many times that it could be yeah. still in town. It's amazing. I don't feel things the way they used to. Oh, I know. Yeah. Um, Look at all that. You mentioned to everyone, if you haven't been in the depot, if you mm -hmm. saw the May 4th depot in one of the historic pictures, we have that depot here. If you haven't been in yet, please stop by because yeah. there's a really great exhibit that goes through. Yes, yeah. If everybody can hear that, and Michael was saying that man here was very marshy and swampy. And it was, and actually one of the interesting things is, if you've ever done this in your yard, if you dug a trench, it tends to fill in with water. And when we dug the Florida East Coast Canal, it drained both sides. So it made the surrounding land less marshy. Yes. Yeah. Any others? Well, thank you all for coming. Have a great weekend. <laughs>